welcome everyone to CFHA Community Conversation. We are glad to have you here today. Folks are still joining us and we'll um, take care of some housekeeping things here for the next couple minutes while people are logging on. But we have a great conversation, wonderful um, participants today, and we're glad that everyone is here. Um, to kick things off, I'll introduce myself. I'm Tanya Lauder, the business manager for CFHA. And my um, co-facilitator is Corey Knight, and I will turn it over to Corey here just in one moment. Um, CFHA has a lot of great programming coming up this, the rest of winter and into spring. I'm going to be posting some event links in the chat. If you are interested in them, you can link right through. Corey has a great slide here to share as well, but we have a virtual conference coming up in April that is has been developed to provide um, valuable programming for each of you in the space of integrated care. So we hope that you'll take advantage of that. Um, some of you have probably participated in virtual events with us or vir the virtual conference during the pandemic, but this is a um, specific leadership and growth conference um, that we've put together for everyone. So. Without further ado, thank you for coming. I will turn this over to Corey and then I will post these things in the chat that you can just grab if you would like to um, like more information on them. Over right, to you, Corey. Tanya. Yeah, thank you, Tanya, I appreciate it. Well, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Corey Knight. I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of Houston Clear Lake. Um, as Tanya mentioned, we work together to host these community conversations and it's always a joy to have you all attend with us today. So today we have some excellent super participants. I wanna thank David Bauman, Rachel Pinnell for joining us today. Uh, really what we're gonna focus on is this idea of high performing DHCs. What does that look like? What are the attributes that are associated with that? Really, how does this look in the day to day? And we're gonna focus on the metrics we use to track this performance. And really kind of what does this mean and how can it enrich the work we do? And so what we generally do with the format of this is we want mm -hmm. uh, our super participants are gonna talk, they're gonna share some of their ideas, their thoughts that come to mind. And we really do invite you all to unmute, you know, join into the conversation, contribute. Um, you know, really we want this to be conversational. And I'll do my best to keep an eye on the chat too in case you don't have the ability to unmute. And so again, thank you both of you for being here today. No problem. I'm glad to be All here. Right. All right. So let's go ahead and jump on in today. So really, I put these prompts up as a guide. However, we're not super beholden to these. So we can deviate, we can pivot, really whatever's best for the conversation here. But generally, let's start off with really, how would you describe a high-performing BHC? And what are the characteristics that make them high-performing? And feel free to jump in. David, do you want to go first? I can. Yeah, that's not, not a problem. And it's good to see everybody. And uh, thanks so much for uh, having me here. Really excited for this. And Corey, hopefully we'll talk on Friday. And good luck to everybody on uh, uh, match day on uh, if you're uh, applying for internship and match day is on um, uh, Friday. So it's always a fun time, uh, exciting, anxiety provoking time, but a fun time for sure. Um, yeah, I, I love the question. And again, you know, I'll be a one trick pony and please, Corey and uh, Rachel, please tell me to shut the hell up if I'm uh, uh, talking too much uh, for this. But um, I think it always starts, you know, with this, you know, functional contextualist perspective, you know, what's the values that we're, we're trying to have. So when someone describes what, a, what is a high performing BHC, that ultimately depends on, I think, the system's values and what they really want uh, to be done. So for us at Community Health Center Washington, our main value as a as a program and as a health center is to serve a large portion of our community that's underserved um, low ses and has a high need and also to make sure our services are accessible and on demand so when we think about high performing vhcs we want their behavior to reflect those values essentially we want them to show that hey we're seeing a high volume of patients uh, to get services out uh, to the community and that it's done in the moment when it's requested and needed so 
you know, quantitatively, we're able to maybe use a couple of metrics to define that. We just actually, I was coming from our monthly meeting where we do our monthly award show and we give out awards specifically about productivity and handoffs. And each one of those awards are geared towards what are our values and what we want to represent. So if someone to ask me what's a high performing BHC, it would be that you're hitting a certain metric uh, for visits uh, per day and that you're hitting a certain metric for handoffs per day, because that's a way for us, uh, not comprehensively, but that's a way for us to kind of reflect that these values are being uh, done. And a mix with that, I think also would be the sense of, you know, doing documentation, getting those things completed, making sure that you're having high patient satisfaction uh, from the patients that you're working with and high patient engagement, and that we're getting good comments from our team members. You know, one of the things that also is part of CHCW, you know, we very much want to promote this idea that yes, patient care is important, and that's going to be the main mission that we have, uh, but also we want to change the healthcare system by not only seeing patients, but doing other program development and different things. So all of our BHCs have projects time. So again, going back to our values and what's important to us, if a high performing BHC, uh, it would be someone that also is completing a high volume of projects that's shaping our health system and making our center more compassionate and more contextually based by influencing people just beyond the patient group. So I'll shut up now, um, I'll, I'll pass it on over. Hey there. Um, so I just got a notification that my connection is unstable. I see everyone kind of their heads moving now, so I think I'm back in. Um, so my name's Rachel. I work in Charlotte, North Carolina at an FQHC here. Um, we are small in the scheme of things, so there are two BHCs here, and we support um, seven or eight providers, just, I mean, FTE, not everyone is, is full-time. Um, so I think Echoing Dave's statements, we're looking at um, someone who doesn't have to say no to a whole lot of warm handoffs because the, the beauty of PCBH and of integrated healthcare is, um, is the yes and when you get asked if you can uh, meet a patient today. Um, we treat a lot of folks who are um, dealing with transportation concerns, homelessness, um, food insecurity. So if they walk out the door and, and say, oh, I'll, I'll get you scheduled, um, high likelihood that they're not coming back. So our high performers are those who um, can multitask and juggle to be able to compassionately take care of those on their uh, schedule while also um, accepting uh, the majority of warm handoffs that come their way during the day. Um, I think there's a couple of characteristics that can help with that. So um, your availability and are you in the door with the in the office with the door closed and trying to get your notes done or are you out and about in the clinic are you sharing an office with uh, the rest of the medical providers so that they see you. Um, so, so sort of that openness and willingness to be a part of the team and a part of the flow is a big one. Um, I also think that if you do good work, you're gonna garner more referrals. So patient satisfaction and provider satisfaction is huge. Um, so are, are your notes reflective of the successes that you've had with your patients? Because if you didn't get a chance to do your verbal uh, closing the loop with a provider, did they read the top of your note and say, damn, that's great. I love that he was able to achieve that with Rachel. That now gives me um, more, you know, more likelihood I'm going to throw more um, referrals your way, warm handoffs your way. So make sure your notes are concise and crisp and, and positive. Um, reflect the, the successes that your patients have had. Uh, but if you can, in the moment, grab the PCP and say, um, I got some a lot more information about what was going on with that patient that we thought was anxiety. Um, if you've got a second, let me talk to you about it really quickly, or um, I'm going to shoot you my note and CC it to you. So the the I, I err on the side of over communicating. I think that um, helps with folks comfort uh, shooting things my way. Um, and so part of that is personality, right? I'm, I'm an outgoing person, but you can train yourself to, to make sure you ticked off that. Did I, you know, was my note concise and did I try to grab the PCP after the warm handoff just to garner more of that um, in the future? Yeah, I, I really like just some of the common themes I was hearing between those things. And, you know, from an organizational level, the values of the organization and really living up to those actions. Um, warm handoffs, that's a must, right? Like you're not going to get used, services are not going to be continued. You're really not going to have the biggest impact for the people that we provide care to unless we're, we're meeting those needs. And I like, you know, what both of you said, David and Rachel, about the fact that like 
that really is sewn into the importance of this work is being there and fulfilling that much needed service and that, yeah, we won't see people in a lot of instances, like they're not going to come back just for a scheduled appointment generally. You know, I think, so I think that's really important. You know, the administrative side, documentation, closing the loop. I mean, those are all so essential to the work we do in providing good team-based care, you know, and so forth. Go ahead. No, just in, to add a little bit more um, concrete response Please. to this, I think it might be helpful if I shared that um, our goals are like eight to 10 patients a day, and we want about half of those to be warm handoffs. So does that look the same every day? Absolutely not. Um, are we holding people to that in terms of, you know, I was under, you know, that's not connected to your pay. I mean, we, we just have sort of this general um, goal that we want to try to reach that we have found works for our health center. So I hope those those numbers can be helpful too to anyone who's listening. Yeah, and, and to try, I love uh, that statement. Yeah, that's where, you know, and I think it's always important for us. I think Rachel and I will probably, you know, agree on these definitions. I think it's always important to talk about definitions, like what do we mean that a visit means and what do we mean that a handoff means, you know, for yeah. us at CHCW, uh, you know, we have a similar thing that uh, our, our productivity expectations is 8.4 uh, visits per day, and those mean billable visits, uh, so these aren't, you know, like meet and greets that are factoring into this, and and similar to handoffs, anything that only gets counted as a handoff, that's a that's a billable visit, that's a meaningful clinical encounter uh, that we're having the same day with the with the PCP, and, and our expectation is um, yeah, 8.4 uh, visits per day, and then and, uh, three handoffs uh, per day. And uh, what's really great in like this past month, we were just looking at this numbers is that uh, we've also had to really ask ourselves these questions like, you know, is it is it the team's average that matters most or is it the individual BHCs that have uh, most because we see this range and we've constantly seen this range now it's gotten more narrow that we don't have so many outliers and as we've done this uh, a number of years but it's an interesting question like what what is the thing that we're focused on is it the, the team average um, which you know this past month for our cores was uh, I think it was what was it 4.8 Eight, so it would have been 9.6, 9.6 visits per clinic or per day, and then uh, it was I think 1.6, uh, so it would be 3.2. So it was 9.6 visits per day as a team, 1.6 for, and the vast majority hit those metrics of you know uh, 8.4 and up and over three and up, and uh, there was some variability with it. So th that's the thing that gets interesting with us is like, should there be variability? And you know, are there are there different things with that? So I think it's a really interesting question. And one thing, Corey, that you said that I, uh, again to highlight um, is I think so often we get this uh, uh, focus on you know what is what are metrics and metrics are good. There's a great book called The Infinite Game by Simon Sinek. And the one thing that we should never lose sight of, though, right? Metrics aren't good uh, independent of context. Um, so seeing, seeing 10 patients a day is not good or bad um, in, in a context, without a context. Now, once you place that behavior within a context and there's an identifying goal, maybe 10 visits is a good thing uh, uh, for someone. Maybe that is a truth. It might not be either. And same thing with handoffs. So regardless of what the system is, um, always making sure that values and missions and what drives organizations, that's what the data is reflecting. And the goal is never the metric because that's finite, right? Like I'm a busy BHC and there's often days I'll see, you know, eight to nine patients in a half day. And the question becomes, if I see eight, to nine patients in a half day, do I just get to go home at lunch? You know, if I do, if I do four handoffs and a, and a half day, do I, again, I'm like, oh, well, I don't have to get any more handoffs. The rest of the day. It's like, no, because that's a finite goal. We always want these things to be infinite values that are reflected in the data metric. Sorry for that ramble and that tangent. No, I, I think that's a that's really good for kind of clarifying and operationalizing some of this, right? Because I do think that's something that does there is some confusion, right? Like, are we supposed to hit this exact quota for the day? Do you know the really this perspective that it is there is kind of this infinite, I guess, sum that we potentially could hit. And I think Rachel, just to kind of initially touch on what you were saying, like eight to ten patients a day, like that's a pretty common metric that I've heard in a lot of cases, right? And Dave, you bring up a great point that you could have a morning where you're hitting pretty close to that, you know? And so, yeah, that doesn't make sense that we would just clock out and be like, all right, I hit my number for the day. I'm calling I'm it done. early. I'm going to yeah. go home, take a nap, you know, do whatever I need to do. 
Um, you know, I really think that that really shows and speaks to the openness and the flexibility of this work, you know, and that the intention that we bring to this work and like one of the wonderful things about the PCBH model as well. I agree. And I think um, we often ask ourselves questions about what should BHCs be doing and our motto, because I've worked with CFHA, is whatever your primary care providers are doing, you all are doing. And that's the same thing. They don't come into work to see 22 patients and then leave. They come in to provide great care to our community. And that's what we do too. And I would say that if you're anxious about the numbers you're hitting or not hitting, ideally you have a relationship with your direct supervisor that allows for you all to have ongoing conversation about professional development and it doesn't feel punitive. Um, and so if you're worried about it, say something, but ideally your um, supervisor will have already shared with you areas uh, in which they want to work on growth with you. So I don't, I don't like when people focus on just meeting a number each day. It just doesn't really capture the work of everything we're doing. But I do think it's important to give people an understanding of where, like, you know, where we are and what our FQHC is um, looking for in terms of productivity. But all of this should be individualized and you know what you're good at and where your areas of improvement are. And so work with your manager on that ongoing. And Rachel, it got me hyped what you said in so many different ways. And, and I think this is an important thing that it's an and, right? Like these, these things, like obviously there's always a context. This is not the goal. And in one of our BHCs, Sarah Ortner, who uh, she, uh, She's incredible because she she often, you know, I get excited. I'm enthusiastic in, in a lot of ways. I'm not saying Sarah's not. Uh, it's just Sarah and I have different kind of perspectives and personalities. And, and the thing that she always says about like metrics, she's like, I've never been someone that's like really been like, oh, what's my productivity uh, for productivity's sake. However, she says that, hey, this is the best way, as Rachel was saying, like, where am I at? right now like this is a way of knowing like am i moving towards my values am i moving towards what's important uh, to me and i think that's a really important thing for us to embrace and you know us behavioral health folk you know i'll speak for me my experience you know a lot of times we shy away from da data right like and, and there's been good reasons because metrics oftentimes have been used in a punitive manner like productivity has oftentimes been punitive and that's that doesn't mean that we throw away data right that doesn't mean we throw away metrics because as Rachel said like it's a great great way of knowing where we need to improve in and um, it's a great way for us to also celebrate wins and share that hey we're meeting this population we're seeing this many people uh, to be able to talk to our c-suite about different things so it's definitely an and I really just I, I love what Rachel and I also love what Rachel said about the uh, uh, do what PCPs do and I couldn't uh, emphasize that enough that's great Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think those are all like definitely really, really important points. And yeah, I, I think that's one of the unique things about this line of work for a lot of people is really the values they do bring to it and really their commitment to, you know, what they put into it. Because this this is not traditional mental health. This is not specialty mental health. It's it's a whole nother life and life force of its own in a lot of ways and with its own set of challenges. Um, one thing... Kelly asked a question. Yes. I don't know, Corey. Did you, okay, perfect. Yeah, I was go. gonna. I was gonna Sorry. segue to that, and uh, I mean, you already you already beat me to it, Dave. So, uh, if you want to feel free to jump in, Rachel, if you all are seeing that. Yeah, um, absolutely. So our um, schedule is three follow up slots in the morning and three follow up slots in the afternoon, um, and then the rest of our time and space is open for warm handoffs um, and admin tasks. So. We have an 8.30 available appointment. It's a 30 minute slot, a nine o'clock and a 10. And so in between your nine and your 10, you should theoretically be able to grab a handoff from one of the first patients that the uh, PCP has seen in the morning. Um, and then after your 10 o'clock appointment, that would be your final scheduled appointment of the day. Um, so that when we get that uh, bottleneck of um, late running providers and a lot of different handoffs at once, you're not competing with, I have someone in the lobby as well. Um, and then similarly for our afternoon, we have a one, a 1.30 and a 2.30. All of those are 30 minute slots. Um, and the rest of the afternoon is open for handoffs. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah, and, and to comment on that one, it's a really good question. Bridget and I just actually, uh, we shot a PCPH corner about scheduled templates that we'll be putting out in a couple weeks uh, uh, shortly. I wish we actually had this out because this is like a, a perfect answer to this. So very similar uh, to what Rachel said. And I think one of the things that, again, 
always think about values, right? Like, what do you want a schedule to produce? And for us, we want our schedules to produce uh, high productivity, high access and handoffs. And we also want provider wellness within our, our schedules, right? Like, you know, we, we don't want providers just getting burned out all the time because they're running back and forth. They don't have a time to breathe. They can't connect with other uh, humans and stuff. And we also are fortunate that within our context at CWFM and CHCW throughout, we have a general ratio of two and a half PCPs to one BHC. Uh, so at our mothership clinic, you know, we have uh, usually about 10 to 11 PCPs on, and we usually have four BHCs on uh, as well. So that allows us the freedom of really using our team uh, to make sure we're gathering all the handoffs because we average doing about 20 handoffs a day um, uh, that is just regularly happening. So for us, similar to what Rachel said, we do kind of a one-on and then what we call a buffer. Uh, so we start at essentially um, 840. Uh, that's a 20-minute visit. Then there'll be a buffer for 20 minutes and then there'll be uh, a 920 appointment, a buffer, so forth off. And then core BHCs will have five follow-up slots in the morning, five follow-up slots in the in the afternoon to be able to have. Now, the one thing I want to point out with this, though, the one thing to remember, and Rachel, you know, you kind of spoke to this a little bit, um, I wish handoffs came sequentially. I, I wish there was a way for us to kind of yeah. understand when handoffs come about. They tend to not, and they tend to also, as Rachel was saying, show up at together, right? The, the multiple handoffs are coming in. So the one thing that we try to do um, is try to schedule as much flexibility as possible within our schedule templates. And also our BHCs are very aware, like, hey, if you have an appointment at 920, a fall appointment, but a handoff comes in at 918, you take the handoff. And then the 920 visit will be running late for it. But that buffer after that visit is going to allow you to catch back up and be more on time. So we're really, um, while it just, it's impossible to schedule when handoffs are going to come through. So our perspective is as much flexibility as you can build in within your schedule to catch up throughout. And more than anything, though, like, you know, as I put into the chat box, we have the saying, it's a horrible saying, but it's warm handoff or die, meaning that we will never let a handoff go if one's being requested, because that moment is improbable with that human being. So we want to make sure we take advantage of it. And that's where knowing that we have scheduled visits at certain times and our patients understand we're like PCPs that will probably be running late um, at times. Yeah, I think that's awesome. Um, and it's cool to hear the differences between my clinic and Dave's, but also the similarities and why we built them like that. We've got a lot of um, commonalities and yet what works for us is not exactly what works for them. Um, as long as you are not drowning in warm, you know, scheduled patients and warm handouts, make sure you have a good balance. Yeah. Wonderful. And, you know, and, and I, Dave, something you had said previously, and this might have been during interview day, I'm, I'm kind of, everything blends together to me in different ways, but the reality too with, you know, accepting those warm handoffs and getting to that scheduled appointment a little later is reflected on the fact that those people during those scheduled appointments know the value you bring, right? right? And, they, and they realize how like beneficial the services are that you provide. And they can, they can be very understanding of that, that it's like, yeah, you know, like this has been really helpful for me in a lot of ways I want you know, to make sure that you have, you can extend this to other people too. No question, Corey. And it's something that Rachel said at the beginning that I, I really thought was just awesome that she said was, um, you know, uh, the, probably the most important thing you can do with BHC, just do good clinical work um, because of how much that just ripples out uh, with not only patients and providers. And as Corey was saying, you know, nine times out of 10, the first interaction that we have with a patient is via a handoff right? There's not a lot of visits that get scheduled as initial visits with us. They're usually just handoffs as our first interaction uh, with them. So I have patients all the time when I'm running late, um, you know, we, we let them know like, hey, I'm going to be 15 minutes late. Our, our reception staff tells them that. And I always say, hey, thank you for doing that. Regularly patients like, hey, I get it. Like, I know the first time that I met you was during one of those handoffs. Um, so, you know, I know you're helping someone else. So it's amazing to see, and we track our patient engagement scores hawkishly. You know, this never comes up, you know, as far as like, you know, running a little bit late. And I know that could be counterintuitive at times to what uh, we get taught oftentimes as a mental health provider, that time is of the, of the importance. And of course, you don't want to run late to run late. I mean, everybody wants to be on time. There's no question about that. And that relational frame that we have with it might not be as strong as what we initially think. And I know there's a couple other questions. Do you, Corey, do you want us to just go through these as they come on? Yeah, so, yeah, so that's we, we really try to just kind of like tackle things as they come. I saw, Mark, you had your hand up too. So I don't want to, you know, d disallow or like not acknowledge that you had your hand up. No, yeah, I appreciate it. You already started to touch on it. I was just going to ask about how you balance um, 
like the interruptions, uh, which are part of the game, obviously, and um, difference in specialty mental health um, with with the satisfaction um, piece. Uh, um, and you've kind of touched on it, but you know, not everybody um, appreciates the interruptions, even though they might see that um, uh, that's you know, maybe how they met you or whatever. Um, and so you kind of want that satisfaction piece. You don't want to, you know, be interrupted multiple times, but you also want to hit those handoffs. Just yeah, how do you how how do you balance that? I have a pretty good response to this. Um, that was me tooting my own horn, I guess, because um, I just figured this out in my clinic because. <laughs> We know that interruptions are a thing and they're going to happen, but sometimes um, it does sort of get in, in the flow of, of where you are in your handoff or your, your visit. So if we're in a warm handoff, we use Epic, by the way, and there's a, um, a color system in the schedule. And so I will change the color of the PCP's visit that I'm in so that the MA doesn't come in and try to give them their lab orders. Um, and we don't use just knocks on the door for our warm handoff um, requests. We use a, a chat in the system so that um, we're not asking people to come to us physically and we can respond to them while we're writing in our note and talking to our patient. So that adds a lot more multitasking to your plate, but it does um, not eliminate, but but reduce and limit the number of times people are, you know, urgently knocking while you're in a session. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more uh, to what uh, Rachel said. You know, our system is that we use Teams that we're moving to Epic. Rachel, I might uh, reach out Ooh, to you. Oh, yeah, please do. Yeah we're, yeah, we're moving to Epic here in the next month. But um, one of the, so we use Microsoft Teams and we have a, we have a, a rule that uh, every BHC will get teams for the handoff. So say a handoff goes out at one of our mothership clinics where there's like 10 to 11 providers on and a provider needs it. All four BHCs are going to get teams like, hey, this is, there's a handoff needed. Each BHC is then required to respond within three minutes of that message. Now, when you actually count out three minutes, it's actually a long time. I voted that I think it should be under a minute that we respond, but it also gives that a little bit of leeway. Like if you are having a pretty intimate conversation about something and there is like, we just don't want to pause uh, that visit or it just is a, a little bit too much to manage like you have a little bit of freedom before you have to respond uh to that response now you have to respond that, that is true and then i think mark the other thing i would say you know uh a lot of this job um is giving yourself a lot of grace and compassion and giving uh, your patients a lot of grace and compassion within that. And I know that's a corny thing to say. And at the same time, interruptions, um, when we think about, you know, again, interruptions aren't good or bad. They're good or bad when we place them into a context. And when a context for us is like access is of the utmost importance, interruptions are a good thing, right? And as you said, Mark, no one's wanting to be interrupted. Like, even though I get interrupted all the time, like I don't want that. I would rather not be interrupted. So I think having grace and compassion for yourself that, yeah, there's times that this becomes a little bit difficult. And I think oftentimes when we turn more towards our humanity and even let patients know, it's like, hey, I'm sorry, you know, I'm getting a lot of message. Let me pause real quick just to respond because I want to be present with you right now. I have been amazed about how much patients you know, give grace uh, during those things. And I think it also does help. And another thing that Rachel said that I think is really important is, you know, this is why I think seeing patients in exam rooms is really important and just being in the primary care culture and context because primary care providers are getting interrupted all the time. Again, not a good thing, not something that we want to have happen, but it's part of that context. And I think patients are a little bit more used to that. And it's like, oh, this is primary care. Like we get interrupted. So uh, I've actually, again, it's another relational frame. My mind has had a kind of a road is a sense of like interruptions. Um, oftentimes I make them a bigger thing. Now I still don't like them. I, I still don't like them. But oftentimes when we interact in a patient, patients give grace for it. Still not fun. Still not fun though. Like when, you know, we have times that, you know, there might be five handoffs literally coming in at the same time. That's a tough thing to manage. Uh, and as Rachel said, you know, you're documenting, you try to be present with the patient, you try to respond to the team's message, you're trying to do all this. It's, it's tough. So give yourself. Yeah. Grace. I think the telehealth question is really mm -hmm. uh, valid and just spot on for what we're dealing with right now. Um, okay, telehealth appointments and warm handoffs are a factor. Um, yes, so we have a really lackluster system for telehealth appointments where I see them pop up in my schedule as opposed to having like a dedicated 
telehealth slot. So um, I ask that if uh, my front desk schedules telehealth, that they give me the first appointment of the morning or the first appointment of the afternoon. Um, Cause oftentimes I find that patients are um, expecting you to be a little bit more prompt um, for a telehealth appointment. So I, I am able to meet that goal. If I give myself my first appointment of the day with telehealth, um, so I don't know if that's that's a helpful response, but I do virtual warm handoffs for another practice. Sorry, it's the same practice. It's a, it's a different clinic location. Um, so with those, um, flexibility just keeps being a theme here. But typically, if you tell the patient, um, you, we're going to do a virtual consult for a behavioral health visit, and I'm three behind at my home clinic. Mm. Um, oh, no, did I freeze? You're there. We can hear you. Oh, you might have froze. It was like a slow freeze, Rachel. It really was. Anyway. Well, as Rachel's coming back, I'll pick up where she left off and I really don't have much more to say, kind of the similar thing. We still do, uh, you know, virtual uh, visits. And one of the great things that, you know, that's bad. It, it's not a great thing about COVID. The, the one of the um, ripple effects that's been proven to be functional is that uh, it really has made us think about using telehealth in a way of reaching people in communities that we weren't able to reach. Now, I would still say, you know, about 80 to 90 percent of our visits now are, are in person. Um, there's about 10 to 20 that might be still televirtual. And it's great because, you know, things like Doximity uh, that allow you to do uh, your appointment right from your cell phone or from your computer. And we operate just like it is like a regular visit. We go into an exam room and we just complete that visit there. Similar to what Rachel was saying, too, you know, if we have visits that, um, um, you know, a telehealth one, and I, if I'm running late, I just respond the same way I do if I was running late to an in, uh, in-person visit where I tell the reception staff, hey, can you call this patient real quick and let them know I'm running 10 to 15 minutes late and I'll give them a call. And people are gracious uh, with that, as long as they know. If we don't tell them anything, people get pissed off and for right reasons. That's where communication is a really important thing. I don't have to, uh, you know, uh, I really liked what Rachel was saying. And I think she was going to say about, you know, covering other clinics. I don't have to do that as far as, you know, um, we are fortunate enough that we have enough BHCs to be on site at every single one of the clinics. So we don't have to do like virtual handouts. Rachel, it sounds like you're back. You're yeah, back. I'm back. Yes. Um, Go ahead. Essentially what I was, what I was saying is, um, the, the only problem with that is if we're clogging up a room at the other clinic. So if they're sitting there waiting and I still need 40 minutes until I can get them on, um, then I will say, do you mind if I give you a call when you're home from your visit today? Do you have Wi-Fi at home to be able to connect with me virtually? Um, and that generally works really well. Um, we, I, I do find that, that there's more flexibility when they're going to meet you virtually because um, you can do it from anywhere. So, you know, we, we ask that um, our patients have a time and place uh, to be able to do that. If, if our first choice, which is meet in person in the clinic, isn't working, then second choice is in clinic with, with virtual. And third choice is I'm in the clinic and you're at home. Um, and yet it's still the same format. Um, so that's sort of my like triage um, when I think about a virtual handoff. And I love, Rachel, I love just the intentionality that you have. And also, I love what you're saying there, like, if you're holding up a room and just different things that are coming up, it's still a yes, right? It's still like, hey, we can call you when you get home. Totally, so, totally. Like, that, that, I, I love that so much. That's cool. That's really I cool. think this also bleeds into the question about, um, like, billing for warm handoffs and about having two visits in one day. Now, I don't... Um, have to deal with this a ton because we do not bill twice if we have a warm handoff we just bill the primary care and then we have grants to eat uh, help us with the cost that gets eaten with those warm handoffs so maybe um, Dr. Bauman if you could speak to that although our consent is just one consent as a clinic we get um, during the application phase of enrolling we ask for your income for our sliding scale fee we ask for your insurance and then we have you sign um, a consent for our team as opposed to for behavioral health we don't do anything separate. Yeah, I couldn't, couldn't agree more with everything that Rachel was saying. There's a lot of just synergy and um, uh, what's the word that will come to me, but um, uh, parsimony uh, is what my mind was going with. So um, similarly, you know, we have one consent uh, for the enrollment into the clinic that goes over and specifies all the team members that not only include, you know, medical provider and a 
you know, behavioral health provider, but also pharmacists, MAs, nurses that they're getting consented to when they enroll. And then obviously when we meet with someone for the first time, we go over our initial informed consent as far as like verbally, like who I am, what we're going to end up doing today really follow, follows the aided kind of structure of uh, when you first meet with people, which is acknowledge, introduce, duration of your visit, um, education about what's going to happen, and then a thank you at the end of the day just to prompt patient engagement throughout that. You know, for us, we're in a good state uh, of Washington, and we're also uh, being a, a community health center, a federally qualified health center. We have a lot of different things that are beneficial for us that um, other states and then other types of organizations that aren't CHCs or FQHCs don't have. So within the state of Washington, Medicaid uh, won't get an extra charge for same day billing. Uh, so essentially 70% of our patients raped in the beginning because they're Medicaid. Uh, if they have a medical visit and a uh, BHC visit, they don't get an extra charge or an extra copay because there are no copays within the state's uh, Medicaid system. So we're able to bill both, both visits. Medicare, uh, you would get essentially an extra copay, but we do a lot of work on the front end to really make sure that we're getting people into sliding scales, making sure that they're using every single part of the healthcare system as far as coverage, uh, insurance, sliding scales from the initial point. Private insurance is the one that we run up to the most because if someone has a high deductible, um, that could essentially respond to you know the entire BHC visit uh, uh, and the PCP visit for that matter. What's interesting, and this is another data point that we track hawkishly, we complete usually about 12 to 13,000 visits a year uh, for our BHC team. And again, billable visits. Um, what we have found is that uh, when we did an audit of how many like patient complaints are coming through, which might not be the best barometer, uh, but just something we, uh, uh, we had two uh, come in over a year span. And what's interesting is that one of them was actually complaining about the PCP's visit billing, not our visit as a BHC. So I think it just be intentional, know your state regulations and what the laws are. And just um, the other thing I'll say, and this might, um, I don't think it's a good comparison because it's still not a good part of our healthcare system. I, it just, the reality is that if we were to get to prescribe someone a medication, that most likely is going to result in an extra payment. If we were going to send someone to a lab or an x-ray that would be something that we would you know the pcp would just be like hey you're going to do that uh today which i'm not condoning i don't think that's the right thing it's interesting that we get weird about bhc sometimes and like billing for it when it's like we bill for all these other things that we think are necessary like why would bhc not be a part of that so it's just an interesting thing but again we, I, a lot of grace in this conversation because with us being in the state of washington and a chc we get a lot of um uh things that we're able to do that uh, uh some states and other agencies can't Wonderful. And, you know, and I think that's a really kind of, it's a good place for segueing in terms of to talking a little bit more about metrics, you know, and I think that's already been something that's come up a couple of times here, right? So billing is very important, you know, making sure we're meeting those warm handoff expectations, the values we have behind that being of service, working, you know, in tandem with our primary care providers. You know, I'd love to hear more about tracking for productivity and Obviously, the punitive aspect can be a concern about this. So I love to hear how maybe this has been addressed in some different ways, really in how these metrics are used to enrich BHC, BHC services. And Dave, you've already mentioned a couple examples. And Court, I was going to say, well. just easily, I could, if, if I'm able to share my screen, I don't know if that's allowed uh, to do, because yeah. uh, I could, uh, uh, if I think it said, can't share more than one screen. But yeah, um, let, me, let me hit stop share and feel free. Yeah, so we literally just did this uh, this morning. That's what the meeting I was coming from. So, uh, uh, and I'll run through this real quick. So every month uh, we review productivity um, for every single, and if you ever want examples of this template that we use, reach out to us. Um, and I will say this, and I don't want to take uh, too long because I know uh, we're pressed for time. The one thing I would say is that <laughs> productivity does not need to be punitive. It can be a celebration. And that's what this award show is. It is a celebration of the accomplishments that we have. So generally what we do is we have a first slide that goes over just some highlights from the previous month. In January, we set records for handoffs and visits. We call out certain people that had incredible months and we go through that. We have an ongoing thing about just um, every year it will reset that this is how we're doing for the year. This is what we're projecting. And then we also have in the bottom what our penetration rate is throughout the organization. So what percent of patients that saw a medical provider in the past year also saw a BHC. So that's the bottom thing. We spotlight someone's 
students' work that they're doing in project time. Uh, so that's something we really want to highlight. And then we have specific clubs. I won't go into all the clubs, but we have a Benjamin Club, Allstate Club. So this is basically number of visits. If you hit 100 visits, you're part of the Benjamin Club, hence Benjamin. Uh, Allstate Club, you're in good hands, so you're completing a number of handoffs. Sharpshooter Club, you're hitting the productivity. And we go through this, and we put everybody's numbers up on here. Um, this month, I love this, that almost like everybody hit the 1.5 and up uh, handoff mark. Um, sharpshooter, and we also how many times they've been a part of that club we track. And then we also have one, did you get your charts done? Uh, we also have one if you did your peer reviews, uh, because those are important things for our organization. So we're good behaviorists, reinforce the things that we want to see. Um, we also have if no one had call outs. Uh, so essentially, you didn't call out from any clinics. Uh, we have a reinforcement of that that happens quarterly. And then we have awards, and we actually give tangible things for the awards. Uh, so um, I hope my team is OK. Is anybody on here? It doesn't matter. It'll be fine. Um, I'll, I'll skip through it. So we have the producer award who had the most individual visits. And we go through this. I don't know if anybody has uh, uh, you know, seen boxing matches or UFC matches. And when they announce the winner, they'll be like, and new like world champion, or we have a lot of fun uh, with these awards. So um, we had Emily who won here. We put everybody's numbers up as far as their visits go. So everybody sees that. And then we do all state award. We have the current title holder uh, and then who won Emily crushed this month. She won most of the awards. Um, we also ask within the all state one, um, what allowed the month to happen because we want people to share tips about what uh, allowed them to do well and then this goes through all the different bhcs that um hits the what their handoffs per clinic and per clinic is just a half day so if you wanted the full day average just times it by two uh, marathon award who worked the most clinics because uh, that's a big thing uh working a lot of clinics that's tough new heights award who was uh who had the most average visits per uh clinic and you have to work so many clinics to be eligible. I only worked like five clinics in the month of January. So my 6.4 average isn't fair to compare to someone who worked like 25 clinics. And then we have a BHC of the month. That's an algorithm that factors in a lot of the data points that we have and they get a gift card and um, what, what happened with it. The other thing I'll put into this award show, how we end is actually this. This is throughout the month, our coordinator gathers pictures of us in our personal lives of doing different things that were healing and fun, and we go through them. So during this conversation, it is celebrating wins and successes. And then lastly, and I'll pass it over to you, Rachel, um, the last thing that we do is after every single one of these award shows, um, we then uh, have the team or we then send out an email individually to each BHC, giving them their data for the past three months. So how many visits per clinic did you have? How many handoffs per clinic did you have? And then also comparing that to what the average was for the uh, whole organization so they have that data. So that's how we share our data. I don't want to go. <laughs> um, we have a, a dashboard that we review quarterly um, with a lot of the same metrics. Um, and my team is tiny, right? But this is inspirational for me. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, I love the energy. I like the emphasis on um, life and not just work. Um, I appreciate the transparency that everyone's numbers are um, out there. And um, yeah, I mean, we can, we can, <laughs> move on I don't I really I don't want to follow that because there's nothing to, get, to follow with but I love you know that and, and I appreciate you saying that Rachel and, yeah. and, and, and it's also I, the other thing like whenever we have these conversations this is something that we've iterated for like the past like 10 years to get right. to this point of doing an award show right and so I think any type of data tracking that you can give and feedback to the team and I will say this listen it's uncomfortable at times, right? Like people don't like, I have one BHC, Julie Aubrey. I love her. Every single month she's teams in me like, hey, how's my data looking right now? Like what's my hand that's doing right now? And the one thing is if you're a director and you're a leader within it, it's like you have to be intentional on how this is shaped in the context that's around it. That's why we do these things intentionally about uh, spotlighting what people are doing, highlighting wins, celebrating the people that had incredible months to really prevent what will naturally occur, which is, this is punitive. I'm embarrassed. I didn't do a good job uh, this month. And that's a tough thing at times to try to create that context. So being very, very intentional and also know, because we've had other people that have said, it's like, I tried the award show, my team hated it. It's like, well, 
they probably will at the beginning. That doesn't mean that we stop though. You know, it's like you have to build that context that really allows these conversations to be something that is celebrated and enjoyed. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I really, I mean, Dave, I always appreciate like the transparency with the metrics because I know you post those on the listserv a lot too, just to highlight what's being done in a lot of ways. And Rachel, even with, you know, a two person team, you know, I appreciate the aspect though of like the accountability and connecting this to like the enriching aspect of all of this. And I think at the end of the day, that's where some of these metrics could be so powerful, right? Is being able to see the impact because in the moment in between visits, you know, Dave is, you know, with contextualism and, you know, in the moment, sometimes we might lose a little bit of the sight of that given the high patient volume, scrambling and that sort of thing. And so it's nice to be able to kind of look back, reflect in whatever capacity we can and say, you know, this is, this is the work I've done this month. And this is a really cool reflection to have in this moment. And, you to, know. and to add to that, Corey, the one thing that I'll, so usually the award show um, takes about 30 minutes of our BHC monthly meeting. What happens for the first 45 minutes though, and really doesn't have a time frame, it just usually goes for the first 45 minutes, is nothing but sharing wins, kudos, and then even intentionally this uh, week today, because it was a crazy busy month. Uh, a lot of people were doing a crazy, amazing things and people were tired. And so one of the things that we did uh, at the beginning of this in the middle of sharing wins and kudos, and we have a rule that we never shut off. If there's a kudo or a moment of gratitude to express, we give the moment to do that. We don't have to put a time limit on. The other thing we did was said, hey, let's talk about if people are struggling and what are we doing to heal ourselves? What are we doing to recharge uh, with it? And that's an important thing because if you just do the award show, you don't have a context of love and support and like caring about other human beings, particularly the providers that are doing this high productivity, that shit's not going to work. Like people aren't going to be down for that. Right. There has to be a context where metrics can be discussed, that this can be an enriching kind of thing. And that starts with, I think the first thing is sharing wins, kudos, making sure people know that we care about each other, not just them as a BHC, but them as a human. I also wonder, Corey, if um, anyone on the call has had any success tracking patient outcomes, because I think we do a really good job of how many folks we've seen, um, whether it was with handoffs or scheduled and uh, what our penetration rate is and all of that. But um, what are people using, whether it's, you know, like a better outcomes now situation, like a, you know, outcomes rating scale, session rating scale, um i think phqs are you know anyway wondering if there's Rachel, a good way i to love do it. I, I love the one you prompted that question and and um my mind's gonna beat me up because i think it would be great to get audience engagement for this so i apologize the one thing two things that my mind went to real quick that you said that is really important we have to be intentional on what outcomes we're choosing to promote uh reflect patients. I know people are all about PHQ-9s. Rachel, I, 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 my mind makes predictions about the pause and the hesitation of what your was, because I'm sure it's the yep. same thing that I feel uh, with it as well. For us, honestly, when it comes to patient outcomes, there's only one that matters to me. I know I rumble with people about this regularly and often. The mm -hmm. only thing that matters to me is patient engagement. Because here's the reality is that we have a lot of good interventions and treatment that work, and we know they can work. Problem is this, no one freaking does them, because we disengage people through and through. We don't make people come to health centers. We do things decontextualized and indiscriminately that just promotes people like, you know, someone coming in for anxiety, we just automatically teach them deep breathing. And then we use the GAD as a response to that. It's like, they damn well, may, it might be a good thing that they have anxiety. I don't know what, if I want their anxiety to go down. What I do want through and through is their engagement with the health system to be through and through. So that's our main, I'll just, I'll shut up now, but that's our main patient outcome is patient engagement, which we have uh, quantitative scores that we get quarterly about what patient engagement is with the system. Will you say more about it? Because Melissa asked, how do you measure patient engagement? Yeah, so we have a specific survey that uh, we have uh, the Crossroads group uh, sends out to our patients and they have a variety of different things. So each BHC, each quarter gets six patient responses. And I will definitely say, you know, six patient responses, that'd be 24 a year, isn't a bad number, but when you put into how many visits we complete with patients, it's actually not that high of an N relative to that. So we want to get a better on that. But we look at things as far as like, did providers involve you in uh, your care today as far as decision-making? Do you feel like the provider was listening to you, that they understand your health history, that they've spent enough time with you? Um, 
there's a couple of other that we get quantitative scores about, and then we track that, and that's something else that we give to the BHCs, and we have an award called the Shining Star Award that person that has the highest patient engagement every quarter that we give out, but that's something that we look at as our primary outcome measure. And I'm noticing too, just seeing Julia's response to surveys in pediatrics, caregiver and patient when treatment is completed as well. Ooh. And so it, it, it seems to me the there's probably some variability across clinical sites in terms of the these types of measures that are given engagement, whether we're tracking baseline, post-treatment measures, that sort of thing. Um, I think something that kind of comes to my mind right now too is really this discretion between symptom-based measures and functioning right, that we can give things like PHQ-9 and, you know, extrapolate a lot of information from that at GAD-7, you know, at the same time, there's this big shift to really focus on functioning over these kind of symptom-based outcomes. Um, so I think that's something, that, at least that comes up for me, and I know that there's, again, there's a lot of pushback in a lot of ways to kind of shift that metric, so I'm wondering if anyone is kind of running into that challenge um, and I'm also seeing two here. There's another comment in the chat as well. So we are using um, the four question outcomes rating scale um, <laughs> in a in a less intentional way than I'd like. Um, but we both of our you know behavioral health clinicians here have the um, have opted in for a yearly membership. Um, and so we are tracking patient engagement that way um, and, and hoping that their functioning scores are moving over to the right, which is I'm doing really well in these four areas of my life. And those are um, personal well-being, uh, social, um, close relationships, and uh, general, what is it? Oh, self-care or something. Ooh. General, anyway, I, I could get them all and, and send them specifically, but um, that's something that one of my goals is to ensure that we're not just using that because we feel like we should, and um, really just because it's helping us inform our interventions, because I want it to uh, to make more sense and be better contextualized. I love that, Rachel. Yeah, the only, you know, we also do use the Duke Health Profile as a measure for every BH visit uh, that we have. So if you're not familiar with the Duke Health Profile, it's developed um, by Duke, you know, who would have thought. Um, but it's a 17 item measure um, that uh, was designed for primary care to look at more holistic. And they, they load on four composites, core similar to almost what Rachel was saying, with uh, uh, mental health, social health, physical health, and general health. Uh, so we do have the ability to track and mine that data. Uh, so I think it's a, a you know, you know, again, that conversation about symptom base, I, I would always continue to uh, reinforce people to go to that uh, article or the report that was put out by the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Um, as of about implementing high quality primary care, and it was put out in 2021. Uh, it, it's really interesting what they talk about with what our outcome measures should be uh, within communities and, and different things. We have, there's definitely a time and pray, place for symptom based measures. It's an and for sure. And we probably have gone a little bit too far towards symptom based outcomes, particularly within certain communities. And so uh, rethinking about what that looks like. Now, the other problem is that there's money and insurances that are now tied to some of those measures. So we got to do what we got to do. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, no doubt. Wonderful. Yeah, I, I appreciate the reflection on that. And I think that's going to be something that's an ongoing challenge in a lot of ways. And I mean, even rating this back to things like patient satisfaction, provider satisfaction, tracking those metrics too, I think can be really challenging. Um, so I'm looking at the time, we have about seven minutes here. And so really just kind of wanted to finish up with, you know, what are some practical tips? For increasing productivity, and I think that you all have given some really great insight into, you know, the day-to-day -day flow, balancing uh, scheduled visits versus warm handoffs. Um, I think that you know, probably my mind has a lot of questions about, you know, that we do have these higher productivity metrics that really connect to the values of, you know, our organization, us as providers. What are some tips, maybe, for some of the people on this call who are looking to increase us increase productivity to better meet their uh, patient population clinic needs. 
Yeah, I think twofold here. My uh, some of my um, granular comments about increasing productivity in a, in a day um, is about time management strategies. So is your um, is your note up and and ready before you walk into the warm handoff? Um, have you um, have you made sure your contextual interview is um, quick? And I don't mean sloppy. I just mean um, how are you asking that patient about what's going on with them? And is it in a way that tailors your appointment or is it in a wandering way that um, is going to throw you off for the day? So I think about time management as one bucket. I think about another bucket as a longer term goal, but relationships with your providers. I mean, proximity to them. Um, some of my most productive days are um, in in an office like this with another provider sitting there and it's just the two of us but because I'm always here and we're passing each other constantly we're seeing all of the same patients um bumpability great exactly thank you Dave um so so my longer term is is team building and um improving your relationships to your providers and my short term is uh micro habits on time management so that you don't get overwhelmed by your admin tasks throughout the day I couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, again, being a contextualist, I always think about what's going to produce the behavior. So I think when you're thinking about that with your team is asking yourself what context would produce high productivity and all the different things that Rachel just said about even, even down to having a sound introduction, you know, I've shadowed a lot of BHCs, you know, through the trainees that we have in then consulting. And, you know, you know, we're talking about 20 to 30 minute visits and people's introductions are five minutes. And it's like, Oh, that, you know, we're, we're setting that up to fail uh, already. Like there's no way that's going to produce productivity throughout the day. So make sure the introduction sound, as Rachel said, regardless, and I love the contextual interview, obviously, and, and making sure that it's structured, sequential, that you know it, that, that there's purpose and attention behind it, making sure the bumpability piece. Is right. I, I really don't have more to talk about with Rachel other than what Rachel said. And I think the other thing is just, you know, maybe as I say that, and then I add more things, I apologize for that. But I think the other thing that comes up with it is like making sure these workflow processes, like, is it easy for a PCP to get a handoff? Because I tell you what, if a PCP has to walk out of the room, look for you, if I was a PCP, I would never request a handoff because that's going to add time to my day. So how can you make the process of getting a handoff so easy, so efficient, uh, seamless that, yeah, for sure, I'll do handoffs all day uh, to, P, uh, to BHCs. How do we make sure like scheduling and these different aspects, charting, how do, because this is something we talk about with our interns a lot, is that if people, if it takes someone 30 minutes to write a note, why the hell would you ever go out and try to get more patients? Mm -hmm. Each patient's 30 minutes, like, come on, we're not, no one's going to do that. So making sure charting is efficient. What context produces the BHC, because oftentimes we talk about characteristics of the BHCs, which is definitely true. And I think the most important thing is values, making sure people have a value of primary care and serving the community. The second thing is though, we oftentimes see that it's like, oh, you know, Rachel, she just is this special BHC and this human that just like she was made for this. And maybe that's true. And um, I bet there's a lot of intentionality of creating a context for Rachel to be successful uh, within this. So looking at this is it's not someone that has it or doesn't have it. It's more looking at it, does the context have it or doesn't have it? And what's that producing? Um, I do not know if this is going to be relevant to anyone on this call. I work with um, a lot of non-English speaking patients. Um, so one of the best things that I did was I got my Spanish intro down um, and I understand a lot of Spanish and my accent's pretty good. So it wasn't a huge lift, but I practiced it a lot. So I walk into the room and I build rapport immediately by using my introduction in their native language. And then I introduce my interpreter so that they know we are going to be using assistance today, but we started off not by, and, and it really, it came about because I was having such trouble doing my introduction through a translator line. So I figured out with some Spanish speaking colleagues how to streamline that. And that's been a really great practical tip to um, kind of get those sessions off on the on the right foot um, while also just putting in some time and letting patients know that I care. Um, so if that is relevant to you, um, please use it. That That is incredible. And the, the other thing that made me think about, sorry, I misspelled a uh, brilliant, um, but I the, the other thing that my mind went to as you were saying that is that also very much challenging ourselves of like mental health good treatment is based on time how many minutes you spent how often do you see them 
as everybody knows, there's no data to support that. Uh, it's something that sounds good and logically makes sense, but there's actually no data to support that time is the thing that actually leads to better outcomes. So really trying to shift that to moments. Moments are what lead to outcomes. And the one thing that Rachel said that really my mind went to is that she said, even in my introduction, I'm able to build rapport immediately with someone that speaks a different language because I can speak that. That's a moment that's free of time that already made that patient more engaged in that visit. So also thinking outside of the box that time isn't the thing that drives outcomes, but that's the way we've been taught that so many minutes, so many you know, sessions or so many visits that we have to have, it's moments. And a moment could be 10 seconds. A moment could be introducing yourself in Spanish. That could be a moment and that could ripple out exponentially. This is a good point. Well, well you know, Dave, Rachel, thank you so much for joining us today. I know speaking for myself and, you know, maybe some of, for, some of for the folks on this call, just the the nuggets of wisdom, the insight, the experience that you all brought to this call has been so just powerful and really understanding, you know, your unique experience, experiences as BHCs, the context you work within, the intentionality you bring to this is just phenomenal. So I want to thank you both again for joining us today and sharing some of this with us. Um, I was so happy to do it. Please um, send an email if you have any other questions that either of us could be helpful in answering. Agreed. And thank you, David and Rachel, for bringing your expertise and experience to this conversation today, and Corey for um, hosting and contributing as well. We're delighted that everyone could make it, and we hope to see you at more CFHA events to come. Thanks, y'all. Hey, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.